Let us call the collection of these forces that push and pull at us from deep within human nature. Human nature stems from the particular wiring of our brains, the configuration of our nervous system, and the way we humans process emotions, all of which developed and emerged over the course of the 5 million years or so of our evolution as a species. Nat, we are officially back at Made You Think. This time for real. It's actually happening, folks. So <laughs> Get excited. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, it feels exciting. Good. I'm, yeah, <laughs> it does feel good. Yeah, no, it's and we we got to do our little a little off topic banter at the start. Uh, for those of you who are on the Patreon, the Patreon's closed now, so there's not a good way to get the bonus material at the moment. But maybe we'll send it out to the email list until we figure out some other system. We we just felt bad running running a Patreon for a podcast that wasn't putting out episodes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> especially because we were promising bonus material and interaction yeah, and with the hosts and, webinars yeah, yeah. so uh yeah. yeah but maybe now that we're back we'll figure out we'll figure out a way to to get all that bonus material back to you guys uh probably the email list is a good way for people to stay on top of what we end up doing there yeah absolutely so today we are talking about the laws of human nature by robert green in case you didn't look at your <laughs> your podcast title <laughs> your, your podcast title yeah we've been excited about this one for a while i think both of us are major major robert green fans and uh, if you can tell from Mastery, if you haven't listened to that, go, I think, episode three, right? Yes. Something like that. Early. Number one's Anti-Fragile, two is Seneca, and three is Mastery. Yeah. So, well, and this is kind of a cool one, too, because before we took our extended hiatus, uh, the publisher actually sent us advanced copies of the book because you know we, we reached out and said we'd done the podcast episode on Mastery and really loved Green's work. And they sent us uh, early copies of this, which was really cool uh, to get that like pre-release version that doesn't even have the table of contents and stuff yeah. in it yet. <laughs> it's kind of like a cool collector's item. So we, we've been excited about this one for quite a while. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, he's been working on this book for, I want to say, what, five years? been a long time it's something like that yeah I, I think it's been five or six years since mastery so even if he took a little hiatus that'd be you know four or five years of work on it and it, he might say that he's been working on it for 20 years because if you look at the themes in this book uh, along with everything he's talked about in his past books it's really clear that this one's influenced by everything he's done leading up to it exactly and actually before we get into some of the content what was your overall takeaway on this? Because I know you've read all his other stuff, um, and so have I. So I'm curious what your what your thoughts were. Yeah, I, I don't want I don't want this to color the discussion, but it wasn't my favorite of his books. It for some reason it felt slower. Uh, I, I just had a harder time getting into it compared to my, my two favorites are Mastery and Fiftieth Law, mm -hmm. and I think Fiftieth Law does really well in its succinctness. Like Green is extremely detailed, but that can turn into a slog at times, I think. Yep. And 48 Laws of Power is also a slog, but it's so, you know, chunked up into the 48 chapters, whereas this one's only like 16 chapters, I want to say. Something like that. Yeah, it's much, much fewer. Yeah, but it's still 500, 600 pages. So you're you're spending a lot more time in the same content. So I, I still got a lot out of it. And I mean, these are actually, I think, my longest notes of any book. Uh, they're like top <laughs> yeah. top three. I'm looking at them right now. Yeah, eleven thousand notes or eleven thousand <laughs> words worth of notes. So I clearly like highlighted a ton out of it. It just felt you know a little slower than some of his others, and I, I've heard that from a few people too. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. I would say if somebody was looking for a um, kind of complete view of all of his work distilled into one book, this is probably that book. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? There's like elements of all the books in here, so I can see you know, why it got so long and dense. But yeah, I would agree with you with that. Like there's a lot to get out of here. There's a lot of useful takeaways. I think it's in the top three for me also in terms of number of, or, you know, number of words highlighted. There's a lot of like, we're not even going to touch probably on 10% of the things <laughs> in this episode because uh, there's just not no way we could do it. But that said, yeah, it was slow. <laughs> like that is that's for sure. Yeah, but still a lot of good material. And Definitely not as molassesy as some of the other books that we've got coming up. So, uh, <laughs> one one of which I think I've been reading for a year now. Uh, although reading it for a year is kind of generous. It's been long periods of not reading. It, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. I think we started that one. Oh, like, yeah, that was 
It's probably been, yeah. We think we planned to do that one in the fall. After sometime. Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was after we finished Atlas. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Good times. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the, the premise of the book is that through his research and, you know, heavy historical focus, Green is suggesting that these are basically the, the laws of human nature. <laughs> They're how we act and behave and like what you can infer about other people or learn about them based on their behavior. And he's broken them out into these. I don't have the number right here, but it, it is something like 16 chapters of different laws about how humans behave. And then kind of each one is digging into historical examples, ways you might notice it in your life, uh, contemporary examples, so that you get a really good sense of like what the law is and what it means for your life, what you should do with it, how you should interpret it, how you should use it. So it's very interesting and historical, but it's also practical. Like it's useful. There's some like tactical value to it, similar to to mastery in yeah. that way, which I liked a lot. Yeah. And there's also sub laws I've not I've realized like as I was going through it the second time um for the notes, like the there's kind of the overarching big law. And then there's there's these subsections, which some of them are laws, some of them are uh action items uh that you can use, but it's I mean, it's like a reference text also, this book. Like, yeah. that's probably the second thing to know is it's not just, it's not necessarily a book you just, okay, I read it once, like, great, I got the point. There's just so much in here that, you know, probably at different times in your life or at different moments, you might refer back to it. And and I mean, I've noticed myself doing that for 48 Laws of, of Power also. I mean, I read it one time, uh, but then there are different instances where you might refer back to like specific chapters that are relevant to what you're you're going through or doing at that point in time. Yeah, kind of like principles in that way too. Yeah. That's another one that's very almost like a reference zone or reference book that you can just keep going back to and pulling stuff out of, but that reads a little densely and textbooky on the on the first look through. So yeah. Done a few books like that now. And actually that's a good that was a good uh point. Like principles had some kinds of overlap, I would say, to to this. Like in the sense that um obviously principles is a different focus. Um, but in the same way, this book, uh, and that book both really like the core of it is human psychology. Um, how we think, how we're wired, the biases, there's a lot of similarities and overlap, but I think they, they obviously tell the story and get the points across in very different ways. Definitely. And if you haven't listened to that episode, it is earlier. <laughs> I don't know that we, we've we've been off for so long. I don't know the numbers anymore. Uh, da -da. Where is it? Uh, that's how Joe Rogan must feel. It's like, yeah, I recorded an episode with that guy uh, some year. <laughs> some, yeah, some year. Exactly. Let's see, is it back in the like 20s or 60s? Oh, wow. It's 15. I didn't think it was that long ago. Jeez, we, we recorded that in December of 2017. Wow. It's, we're getting old. We're getting old. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and dive in because we've got uh, like 18 ish chapters to get through and we're going to need to try to be a little a little bit strict. I think I've got a five minute timer here. Should we, <laughs> should we use that to keep ourselves honest? Because I think otherwise we're, we're really going to run the risk of uh, not finishing not finishing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah let's go for it and we'll see what happens it's kind of like those uh those recap episodes yeah exactly all right so I'll turn it on people will be able to hear it so they'll know okay five minutes let's go uh first up is the law of irrationality uh and i think the core of this one is what he says in this first line here that you may think you're rational but you're not Yep, And that the first step toward becoming rational is to understand our fundamental irrationality. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that because um, I think it's so common and we all fall into this trap of thinking that we're the rational ones and everyone else is irrational. Like, how can those people vote for Donald Trump or like, how can those people support such and such person or, you know, but I guess the point that he's trying to make here is that we all have irrational beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the closer or I guess the best way to become more rational is having that awareness of yourself being that, that you are also not a rational, fully rational creature. Yeah. And he spends a lot of time in this chapter talking about different biases. And I like that he, he almost writes it as if he hasn't read any of Kahneman's stuff where it's very like he's using his own names for things. Mm. He might not have read his stuff. 
I guess it's possible, but I find it hard to imagine that he hasn't. Yeah. Uh, and so he goes into some, but there's obviously a lot that he leaves out. So he talks about uh, kind of like conviction bias or group bias, uh, superiority bias, where you think like you're better than everyone. Uh, and we've actually got another episode that goes way deeper on this, which is on Charlie Munger's yeah. Poor Charlie's Almanac, which is number 17. If people want to check that out, because that's a really good overview of all these different like biases and heuristics we're using to make decisions that make us less rational than we think we are. Exactly. Yeah, but he gets into a lot of these here as well. But I think I think his biggest kind of like if you had to take one takeaway from this chapter it's that uh the awareness part the self-awareness and reflection can help you prevent from making prevent yourself from making irrational decisions that you'll regret later yeah well and i like that he mentions or he talks about looking at your past decisions the ones that have been ineffective or that you know have been bad choices and seeing if you can find a pattern in them right so like where do things break down how are you making decisions when stuff goes wrong for you because that will usually be uh an indicator of some irrationality right some insecurity yeah. or some bias that you have that's leading you repeatedly in the wrong direction that you want to weed out if you're going to improve your decision making over time 100 percent. yeah i would say like one other thing i took personally as a as a uh, really good piece of advice from this, because I've been prone to doing the opposite, um, where he says, increase your reaction time. So when yeah. some event or interaction requires a response, you must train yourself to step back. I have in the past irrationally, like, respond. Yeah, definitely irrationally. But like, if I got pissed off at an email or, you know, something that somebody did, I would be very quick to respond with my own pissed off email. <laughs> <laughs> and that never helps things, right? It never yeah, actually weird, solves the problem. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it just makes the problem worse. It might make you feel good in the moment, but then, you know, the next day you're like, shit, I shouldn't have sent that. Sent that. Yeah. Makes you feel good very briefly. Yeah. So it's funny. It's like that old advice of sleep on it actually is really good. So what I'll do now is to make myself feel better. And I've actually done this a few times since reading this book. Uh, I'll type up the email that I wanted to send but I won't hit send. I'll sleep on, on mm. it. And then I haven't yet sent an email that I slept on like that. Nice. Because you wake up the next day and you got the, you got the feeling of typing it, right? So you, you got that anger out. But then when you wake up the next day, you're like, wait a minute, this is not the right way to solve this problem or, or actually make any progress whatsoever. This is only going to make things worse. Yeah. So it's that really helped. And I'm sure, I mean, every bit of advice in this is really good. But uh, the increased reaction time one I personally found to be really helpful. Awesome. All right. Let's jump into the next one, which is the law of narcissism. Transform your self-love into empathy. W one thing I found interesting in this is this idea of healthy narcissism, mm. where he's basically saying that everyone is a narcissist to some extent, but if you're healthy about it, you have a stronger, more resilient sense of self, and you can recover more quickly from wounds and insults and you don't need as much validation from others it's basically like self-confidence self-assuredness uh and having like a healthy respect of yourself and i think that that's a healthy way to look at it because if this is like a law of narcissism where everybody is going to be a little self-absorbed there's probably a healthy level of that where you can say okay you know, I, I'm good at these things or these insults like don't matter. They don't actually define who I am or I don't need like Instagram likes to feel good about myself. And that level of narcissism is good as long as you don't take it to the extreme of like grandiosity and being completely full of yourself. There's there's a balance in there. Yeah, there's definitely a balance because if you're I guess if you don't have any kind of narcissism whatsoever, which probably is humanly not really possible. Um, I mean, maybe it is. I, I don't want to to make that judgment. But I guess, um, you know, if you're, if you're not narcissistic at all, then you probably can't survive because <laughs> yeah. you need to put your needs at some point, right? Like uh, to do anything. But at the other end, it's like, it's very easy to fall into the trap of being overly narcissistic. And social media definitely makes that easier because now you can quantify how much people like you. <laughs> they like me 50 likes worth or 10 retweets worth, or, you know, uh, I, I did like this other thing that he brought up. I uh, So this isn't in your notes, but I have it on mine, which is kind of turning that self-love into the empathy part. So I'll just read this part from the book. The best place to begin this transformation in your attitude is in your numerous daily conversations. Try reversing your normal impulse to talk and give your opinion, desiring instead to hear the other person's point of view. 
you have tremendous curiosity in this direction. Cut off your incessant interior monologue as best you can. Give full attention to the other. What matters here is the quality of your listening so that in the course of the conversation, you can mirror back to the other person things they said or things that were left unsaid but that you sensed. This will have a tremendous seductive effect. So, I mean, he's talking about this almost like from a uh, 48 Laws of Power style thing, like this is a tactic you can go use. But it's interesting that, uh, I mean, I, I know when we have our, our recordings, right, like we've, we've both spoken about this. In a lot of ways, they're like a very much a mutual conversation. Um, but then we've noticed mm-hmm. definitely in conversations with others and, you know, it's it, it happens to everybody. There's really two monologues happening and then you just happen to be speaking at each other, but you're not really having a conversation. So I found I found this tactic to be really useful. Um, and I think you you do a great job of this. And uh, especially when we record, you know, in person, you're great at giving visual cues of listening and and you're you know, you're good at picking up on, as he said, like things that were not said, but that you sensed. But I think that goes a long way to showing the other person that you, you're actually paying attention and people do really respond to that. Well, and it, I feel like it's getting rarer too. Like it's harder and harder to get the sense that people are listening just because it does feel like people are so wrapped up in their phones and stuff that they're just like not giving you the same kind of attention they might have in a, a, a pre-phone, pre-tech world. Yeah. And which actually makes this tactic even stronger, right? Because you can yeah. really stand out. Yeah. Because ultimately, I mean, this is this is uh, related to the same point of, of narcissism. Everybody just wants to feel heard. I mean, that's why people are posting or they want to feel like they want the attention, right? And so if you're giving them that attention uh, in person, which is, you know, increasingly not that common, as you said, it, it's a good way to stand out and, and to probably increase that person's connection with you to really feel like, wow, you know, I want to hang out with that person again, or, you know, I really respect that person. And, you know, little do they know it's probably because you're playing to their narcissism, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but as you said, as it gets more rare, rarer and rarer, it's, uh, it's increasingly valuable because of that. Yeah, exactly. All right. We came in just under time on that one. That was good. Next up is the law of role-playing. So see through people's masks. I didn't have as many notes from this one. Did you have any that uh, that I didn't capture? It seemed like the, the big thing I got was that there are, it's like everyone's putting on a show in some form. And the main things that you want to try to catch are signs of like liking or disliking, dominance or submission, and like general deception. Yeah. The The one thing I had with this section though was that I feel like when we did what everybody is saying, mm. I got I got the sense that like Navarro would not agree with a lot of the stuff in this section because it did feel like Green was suggesting that you can actually detect all of this stuff pretty accurately. And it felt like Navarro would not agree with that assessment. Maybe some of it. Yeah, there'd probably be some disagreement there. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that I highlighted from here was actually a totally different section. It was in the art of impression management which I think is like one of the subsections when he talked about Bill Clinton. So I'll just read it from the book. Uh, A master performer like Bill Clinton never lost sight of the fact that as president, he had to project confidence and power. But if he was speaking to a group of auto workers, he would adjust his accent and his words to fit the audience. And he would do the same for a group of executives. Uh, And I've noticed politicians do this really, really well. Uh, I'm sure, you know, other people in like, in uh, industries or in or not not industries, but in professions where they uh, have to speak to a variety of different groups, probably learn this instinctively. Uh, but I could yeah. imagine. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine you can't speak to like a group of professors the way you would speak to, you know, dock workers, for example. But if you needed votes from both of them, you would have to figure out how to connect in some ways. And yeah, I mean, politicians are, are like, that's what they do. I mean, that's their <laughs> that's their that's the part of the genius um, of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I just. It was nice that he kind of called that out, but I never thought about it that way that he's, I mean, maybe the accent part is a little overboard, but his words definitely, um, like the kind, like it doesn't make sense to speak over or under your audience, right? Like there's just no, right. you wouldn't be able to connect with them. And I guess it could apply to writing too. That if you're writing for a specific audience, hopefully you use terminology that they recognize and that they care about. Yeah, and I guess the trick then too is, not making it so over that they pick up on it. Exactly. Because that is pandering. Yeah, exactly. You, you can see it going the wrong way where people feel like you're talking to them like they're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, which you don't want. 
Yeah, no, that's that's definitely uh, that's definitely true. But yeah, you you notice like politicians will sometimes be like more folksy in certain environments, and then all of a sudden look like a CEO in another environment, and it's the same person, but yeah. they're just changing. Like I noticed Obama did the same kind of stuff, and I mean I'm sure every pol- I mean Donald Trump doesn't seem to do it too much. He's just yeah, I was going to say Trump's pretty consistent. Yeah, <laughs> Trump's pretty consistently Trump. But uh, yeah, I've noticed like other like most politicians I would say do that. Even Bush, like if you see clips of Bush speaking in a large audience, he's very folksy. But then there are also clips of him like speaking about business and he's much more, I don't know, like collected and like a CEO kind of vibe that he tries to give off there. Um, So it's not like a Democrat Republican thing. It's just like all politicians besides, you know, a few notable exceptions uh, try to do this. Yeah. And I feel like the big thing Green is getting at is that everyone is doing this all the time in some fashion. And you just kind of need to be aware of that and try to look through it, I suppose, or try to see. It's like, okay, they're putting on some form of show here, but where is like the actual person underneath that? And what can I like infer is an act versus the real thing? Yeah, that's 100% right. Yeah. All right. We're doing good so far. We haven't. We're we're staying within the the five five minute bounds. It's unusual for us. We're still awaiting our first tangent. So and and so is yeah. the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just saving the time. That's what's missing. We haven't had tangents yet. <laughs> yeah, they'll come. They'll come. This is like a meta tangent. It's a tangent tangent. Yeah. Oh, it's a tangent within a tangent. Strange loops. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> uh, okay. So the next one is the law of compulsive behavior. So determine the strength of people's character. And this is basically that a lot of people do have some form of, you know, compulsion in how they act. So they, they do something over and over again that they're not even really probably noticing they're doing, but that you can pick up on if you're paying attention. And he's got a lot of what he calls the the toxic types. So these these types of people who have a, a compulsive behavior that you can pick up on and that you can infer will lead them to like similar I guess, downfalls or, or issues or re- reasons to avoid them. Uh, probably don't have time to go through all of them. Yeah, but <laughs> there's a bunch. Yeah, but there's there's like a few big ones here. You know, I think like the big talker is definitely one that at least you see in like the startup space a lot where people who have huge ideas and projects they're thinking about doing and they want help and backers. Uh, but then you realize that like all they do is just hype things up and they never actually do anything or they've only done like one little thing and then it's all been talk ever since then. Mm, yep. And there's really no reason to expect that this time will be any different. I thought that was a good one. Yeah. I, I think the drama magnet's a good one too. You see that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not necessarily just in like startup world, but like in every, I mean, pretty much any social environment. Uh, there are certain people, I mean, you probably noticed this in high school or in college, like there's certain people who always have drama, no matter what's going on. Like, like it's rare for them not to have drama. And there's something to that. I mean, I think what he's trying to say here is that everybody is basically a type to a certain extent or some, you know, amalgam of different types. But these are these are just like categories, I guess, to like put put names to them. Uh, and there's a lot here. There's probably too many to go through each and every one. Well, and that's probably part of the value too, is looking through them and seeing, okay, where, where do I fall? Right. Or like, which ones do I like see in myself? Cause that, that's, that's a good way to like develop some self-awareness too. Or maybe to correct for some of those things if, if they're causing problems. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. You can read this book two different ways, I guess. You can read it with the eye to learning more about other people. Um, and there's probably a lot of useful stuff there. And then you can also read it just with an eye towards yourself. And there's probably a lot of useful knowledge there too. Definitely. It's the laws of your human nature as well. So unless you're not a human and you're reading this book, in which case I want to meet you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. You've so internalized all of Green's books that you are immune to these lowly human faults. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he ever has gotten that question in in a uh, interview before. What what would the question be? Oh, like some like annoying journalist says, like, "Well, if you're so special, right? Like, <laughs> do you ever fall into any of these traps?" Or I mean, I'm sure he would say oh, he yeah. does, um, but I'm sure like someone would try to make it seem like he's like preaching to people. <laughs> Did you listen to Sam Harris's interview of uh, Daniel Kahneman? No, I didn't. But tell me about it. Tangent number one. Here we go. Uh, it's a quick one, though. Sam asked him at one point, like, 
what, you know, how have you improved your behavior by studying all of these biases and things for your whole life? And Kahneman's just like, oh, I haven't at all. Like, I'm just as fallible as someone who knows <laughs> nothing about them. <laughs> yeah, I heard um, on, uh, I'm looking for the, the title of the book right now, but on Joe Rogan, he had uh, the Uninhabitable Earth author on, David Wallace Wells. Okay. And uh, it's a inter- really interesting episode. I haven't read the book yet. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, I got I got the book. I just haven't opened it yet. But it's um, it, like I remember <laughs> near the end, he asked him a question of like, well, how have you changed your life as a result of this research? And, and then the author kind of went on this a little bit of a like a rant almost not like an angry rant, but just I'm sure he gets that question a lot. So he he said something like uh, he's like yeah I'm not eating any fewer hamburgers than I was before doing this research <laughs> because like how much difference can you know like one person really make in this I mean yeah it, I'm sure he gets that question all the time and people are probably like the second he order eats like steak or something just like look at him like oh or, do you drive a car or you know you took a flight to get here you hypocrite um, so I'm sure that can get pretty annoying I did like his answer though I agree with good. you that it was kind of a cop out but no, I do no, think it was it's a good fair answer. that. It was a great answer. Yeah. These little individual interventions, especially in like climate change, environmental stuff, don't really do that much, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, No, I thought his answer was great. Like, I I think he did a a good job of it. I'm just sure he gets that question so much. So you could kind of tell he was, I don't know, just a little annoyed with the question. Sick of hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like if someone flies him out for an interview and then asks him that question, he's probably like, well... I don't know. What do you want me to do? Just not come to the interview? <laughs> yeah, like just take a bus. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up is the law of covetousness. Become an elusive object of desire. He's talked about this one, I feel like, in every book. It's yeah. in 48 Laws of Power. It's in uh, Seduction, obviously. It's kind of a theme in Mastery for like drawing talent to yourself. Uh, he really loves this idea of creating an air of mystery around yourself and the work you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, it's a good, uh, he definitely talked about it a lot in 48 Laws of Power. I think Art of Seduction is a lot of, like a lot of that book is based on this this chapter. I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. But I think it makes a lot of, it makes a ton of sense because uh, I think it, even just that, that saying the grass is greener uh, on the other side, like, that's intimately connected to this just because any person you get to know really well, and this is, I've noticed this is very true for relationships, especially like the, let's say like people are using dating apps, for example, right? The people you're connecting with on dating apps are always seemingly perfect, especially, you know, you haven't gotten to know them at all. So they have no flaws, but then as you get to know someone, right? Like there's, there's, they're all human beings, presumably. So they're not, they're not perfect. Um, and as you get to know someone, you, you know, they let, they let their guard down a little bit and you, you learn more about their faults. Um, so his point here, I think is like in general, if you stay at a, you know, slight distance or you, you kind of keep, you don't give somebody too much, then you have that air of mystery and they can project whatever they want to project onto you which is usually makes you look better than you actually are. Yeah. And I like how he turns it around towards the end of the chapter two and talks about trying to realize our own desires that may not be internally driven, Yeah, especially in an era of so much advertising and marketing. It's like, what is something that you actually want? And what's something you want either because you think it's going to be useful, like for signaling or because that desire was kind of, incepted into you by good sales and marketing from a company yeah or maybe it was a desire of yours from when you were younger and then you just kind of carried it over um i think in 12 rules for life that was uh brought up as well where i think peterson said uh something around the along the lines of uh you know if you ask someone you know what do they want to do they say oh i want to you know make enough money so i can just sip margaritas on the beach yeah (laughs) and he brings up the great point of like Okay, well, how how many margaritas? Like, how long do you want to do that? You know, after six months of doing that, you would probably be sick and you know have like a serious yeah. health condition. Yeah. So he just like the point is that uh, I think you're like the point you just brought up that how many of our desires are actually internally driven versus driven by uh, maybe what we're seeing other people do or uh, marketing, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of that. Yeah, and, and recognizing that as soon as you get something, it's probably not going to be that satisfying, right? (laughs) It's the going after it that's usually the fun part. And so you you simultaneously need to realize that like the things that you're going after won't make you that happy once you get them. 
but that you should still keep going after things because it's the going after them that is satisfying. Yeah. Like in this weird way, like it's the, the, the striving is the exciting part. Yeah. And so you totally. kind of need to keep moving the goalpost in a way that is satisfying without making it like Sisyphean. Right. <laughs> exactly. But I think it's also important. I mean, life is kind of like that in general, <laughs> regardless, yeah, but, but if you like, I like, for example, uh, like something that, that you're, you're doing, like opening up the cafe, right. It's tangential to something you're already doing, but it's a whole new avenue for you to explore and learn about and try to get good at. And it's not, um, it, you're just shifting. You have like a new, a new project, a new, a new muse to work on. Right. Right. And I find that that helps like kind of avoid some i mean maybe it's it's part of it doesn't really help you avoid but it like plays into this a little bit um but it keeps it kind of like keeps you ha- having new things to chase yeah and that's probably we're we're both like showing i think uh <laughs> an aspect of our own psyches here that we think that that's that's uh exciting and good rather than crazy because there's probably a segment of people who think we're nuts for thinking that that's smart. <laughs> that's the whole like meditation and mindfulness thing, right? It's like learning to be satisfied with what you have. And I don't know, I find that kind of boring, right? As long as you don't have like an unhealthy obsession with wealth or like sexual attention or something, like if you want to keep going after stuff, like go for it. Yeah. And I don't think those things have to be uh, mutually exclusive, right? Like I would say there's plenty of people who go after a whole lot of things who do meditate or do practice mindfulness. But yeah, I see what you mean in general. Like it, in, in, on the surface, they don't seem to be uh, like they would have much overlap, but it, it seems like anecdotally, at least, there are plenty of people who meditate who are still going after stuff. But I guess, yeah, I mean, on the surface, it doesn't seem like they're compatible. Yeah. All right. Next up is the law of short-sightedness. Elevate your perspective. This is, I mean, he's talking about similar stuff here as in, the irrationality one, where he mentions, again, specifically training ourselves to detach from the heat of the moment, you know, draft the email and then yep. go to bed, <laughs> take a break. Yeah, there were some really good uh, examples in this chapter, though, that I really liked. Yeah, do you have one highlighted there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm uh, pulling it up. So um, I love the uh, the South Seas bubble. That one was really interesting. The, the one with like Isaac Newton and... Uh, Hold on. What was the exact thing? Uh, I'm going to go to the part in the book. Did you have anything from that highlighted? Uh, well, I liked I, I liked this idea, and I've heard this you know, in a few different places, but that for any group or team, you kind of want someone in charge of gaming out all the ways something could fail. Yes. Right? Yep. Like, how is this going to break down? Because the the when you're doing planning, you're probably not thinking about random stuff that could blow up the company or the project or the the team's plan that isn't factored into your plan at all it's sort of like black swan preparedness and i think that's like a really useful practice or a really useful way to think so like did you have that in there yeah that you elevate right so you're saying because it's easy to get caught in the day-to-day actions and the i mean that's kind of like the heat of the moment right you're just scrambling to okay you got to answer this customer thing or you know, close this account or pay that tax or whatever, right? It's like the day-to-day moment, but it's good to at least, as you said, have somebody or just be constantly kind of trying to zoom out also. Also just like on the same note, like things where things could go wrong, but also just look at like, where's the ship going? (laughs) You know, (laughs) because you can, you can very easily get caught in the day-to-day and then never think about that and then realize like, oh, wait, we're in a place we didn't want to be. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, even though even if it's working right it might not have been what your original goal was or you know just yeah you might be taken by surprise where where things go um if you're not zooming out and and kind of like looking at the big picture Uh, yeah the south seas example was more just uh it was it was like a bubble right that's uh that he was talking Mm -hmm. about there and how kind of like nobody really zoomed out even people as smart as uh isaac newton um who did figure it out but then you know thought too much so i'll uh I'll read that part from the book. So it says, uh, once the English saw their compatriots making large sums of money, it became a fact. The scheme had to be a success. They too lost the ability to think a few months ahead. Look at what happened to Isaac Newton, paragon of rationality. In the beginning, he too caught the fever, but after a week, his logical mind could see the holes in the scheme. And so he sold his shares. 
Then he watched others making much larger sums of money than his paltry 14,000 pounds, and it bothered him. By August, he had to get back in, even though it was the absolute worst time to reinvest. Sir Isaac Newton himself had lost the ability to think past the day. As one Dutch banker observed at the, of the scene in Exchange Alley, it resembled nothing so much as if all the lunatics had escaped out of the madhouse at once. So it's like, uh, I think like when you see other people doing something, mm-hmm. you kind of, uh, it's like a herd mentality, right? You like, you doubt your own logic. And I think that applies to a lot of stuff, like not even just money or investing. I think it also applies to selfies, for example, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like that has been become very normal, right? And you just see other people doing it. And so like, it just seems normal because other people are doing it, but it is a little bit strange. <laughs> or these, these places that Instagram influencers will go to yes. just because, like literally going there because of the photo you get. Yep. Like that's a weird one. I had a like a, a Twitter thread and a conversation with some people about this where um, I think there's like so many restaurants now. I don't know if you've had this happen in Austin, but I definitely noticed yeah. it uh, in New York, right? Where it's like, they've spent so much time and money trying to make it an Instagrammable restaurant that they like forgot about the food. Like the food is a sideshow. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, it's the definition of premium mediocre. It Instagrams better than it tastes. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Although it's funny enough, on, like I, I agree and I agree that it's bad. That said, we're probably going to try to get a graffiti artist to come like paint one of the big walls outside of the cafe with some sort of like, cool art and austin-y slogan nice so that we can make it into an instagram spot there you go don't hate the play i hate the game right that's yeah. as long as it works. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> that's exactly right I don't like it but i will take advantage of it <laughs> yeah and by the way there's one other story in here that was really good yeah do it so this was like this was kind of like related i think this will be very relevant to seeing like a state also which is an upcoming book by the way spoiler alert um because it kind of it shows the unintended consequences of top-down approach. So Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just read this from the book. Uh, In 19th century India, under British colonial rule, authorities decided there were too many venomous snakes, uh, too many venomous cobras in the streets of Delhi, making life uncomfortable for the British residents and their families. To solve this, they offered a reward for every dead cobra residents would bring in. Soon, enterprising locals began to breed cobras in order to make a living from the bounty. The government caught on to this and canceled the program. The breeders, resentful of the rulers and angered by their actions, decided to release the cobras back on the streets, thereby tripling the population from before the government program. <laughs> so again, that's like as nobody zoomed out there and was like, well, what are the second order effects of this policy? <laughs> yeah, we're going back to uh, to Munger's episode, right? It's uh, just look, look at the incentives, yep. right? Like, what are you incentivizing? Yep. And in that case... It's, I don't know, maybe maybe we're biased, but it does feel like if you'd thought about it for a few minutes, you, you, somebody <laughs> would have had the idea that like, hey, what if people just start breeding cobras? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. Yeah, let's move on. Next up is the law of defensiveness. Soften people's resistance by confirming their self-opinion. So basically, everyone thinks that they're autonomous and acting of their free will, that they're intelligent, and that they're good and decent. And... Regardless of whether or not those things are true, uh, it behooves you to make pe- to, to confirm people's beliefs in that about themselves. Yep. This is, uh, like, I would say, like, the quintessential character that I think of when I think of those three things. Like, everybody thinking that those things about themselves. Um, if you've mm-hmm. ever seen The Godfather, Fredo. It's Fredo. I haven't seen it. Ah, uh, okay. So we will we'll save the Godfather discussion. Maybe that'll be a good movie episode someday. There we go. But basically, he's like the so he's the second son out of the three. He's kind of known throughout the family and to other people as like the family idiot who also does some sleazy things and gets the family in trouble. But despite all of that and all the evidence staring him in the face, like he thinks he's an intelligent and good human being. Yeah. So yeah, there's like everybody thinks that of themselves. Uh, it doesn't matter what they've done or what the I mean, I, I don't know if it's everybody, but there's probably a very, very, very small percentage of people who don't think that about themselves. Yeah. You just gave me this idea by saying movie episode. We should do The Matrix sometime. Mm, I like it. That could be good. Yep. Or Primer. Have you ever watched Primer? No, I haven't. All right. That is the best time travel movie ever made. I highly, highly Oh, you, you told it. me about it. Yeah. Is that the one made on a very small budget? Yeah. It's like a $2 million budget. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, I remember you told me about this. All right, let's do that. I think we talked about yeah. this in one of the episodes, but yeah, we talked about it before. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anybody listening who hasn't watched it, you should go watch it, including Neil, including me. Yep. But uh, so the one thing he has in here are kind of like five strategies for instilling those beliefs in the people you're talking to. And he calls that being a master persuader. Uh, so the first one is becoming a really deep listener. And the, the trick he uses or that he gives for that is getting in the habit of repeating back to someone something they have said, but like in your own words and filtered through your experience to really show that you've been listening and paying attention to what they're saying. Uh, I find that's like an incredibly effective way of confirming that you are paying attention to people. Yeah, 100%. And I think like if you try to do that, you have to listen, right? It's really hard to not pay attention and still successfully do that. Exactly. It's not even like a hack or a trick because you can only do it if you are actually listening <laughs> yeah. to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really a shortcut. But I guess if you think of it's a shortcut and then it might force you to actually listen if that's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> um, another one that he mentions is like confirming their own self opinion. So even if you're going to ask them to do something like finding a way to get them to think it's their idea is, is always very effective, right? Like yeah, leading questions and like finding ways to get the idea into their head without you telling them exactly what to do. Like it gives them that sense of autonomy, uh, which can be really effective. Yeah. It's also surprising how well that works sometimes, but I think it also all goes back to the narcissism too, is that you don't think somebody yeah. else might be using this tactic on you, even if you use it on other people. <laughs> right. I liked this idea too, which I hadn't seen before. This is new, is if you need a favor from someone, don't remind them of what you've done for them, but remind them of the good things they've done for you in the past. That's in 48 Laws of Power too. Oh, it is? Okay. But it's a really good, no, it's a really good tactic though, that, uh, like it doesn't help to remind people that they owe you because then they're just going to resent you even more, even if they end up doing, right. I mean, like that, I think in 48 laws of power, he uh, specifically talked about how people resent or can resent people that have helped them because you feel like you're in debt to them or something. Yeah. But yeah, in this case, like this tactic is really good where you remind them of the good things that they have done in the past. So then it makes them want to live up to that self opinion of being a good person. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I like the uh, the the strategic flattery part, though. So he says, if I know that I'm per particularly awful at basketball, praising me for my basketball skills in any way will ring false. Yeah, so you can only praise people when they're uncertain about their skill at something. Yeah, or at least has to have a kernel of truth to it, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, if somebody is like horrible at math and you're like, wow, you're great at calculus, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, they're going to be like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Next up is the law of self-sabotage. Change your circumstances by changing your attitude. This is another one where he kind of like lists out a lot of bad mental routines people get into. Yeah. I think both so that you can recognize them in yourself and so you can recognize them in others. And these are definitely ones that, again, you like see all the time, either in the media or in people you know or in yourself it's like these they're the kind of things that once you know them they're hard to not notice uh, which i think is a way that he makes the book very useful for people yeah and again it goes through like a bunch of different categories and um i think each one of these is useful to look at because again i i don't know i don't usually think people fall into like one of these categories it's probably a like it's almost like a venn diagram of different yeah. ones well, and depending on like your mental state or whatnot. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not like necessarily a static thing. Yeah. Although on the flip side, you definitely do meet people who are just like perpetually avoidant or perpetually resentful or perpetually anxious, right? Like, yes. Yeah. And I don't know when, when you see one of these, uh, these like self-sabotaging mentalities come out constantly in people, it makes it very hard to be around them. Right. So I feel like that's where the book gets really useful in this in this section anyway, is like, okay, am I doing any of these things and could they be driving people away from me? Yeah. And and I think people can temporarily do some of these things too. So you can, you can also use it as like a self-correction. Yeah. Which is, I would say that's like the surface of what he's talking about here. But then of course, the second layer is seeing it in other people too. Well, and, and also noticing how you can end up in these attitudes is useful too. Mm. It's like, I noticed that like when I was getting a lot of political stuff in my Twitter feed, I just felt more hostile. Yeah. Right. Like more combative. And I've just been 
every basically every time there's something in like the political gestalt, I just go in and ban all the words related to it from my Twitter timeline. <laughs> Smart. It's a way more positive place now. It's awesome. Like, and I can feel that I am less like tense when I'm going through my feed too, just because none of that stuff gets to me anymore. It's amazing how much we think that we control our own moods and stuff, which I guess in in some ways you are doing by muting things, but it's so much affected by your environment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It's like if you were constantly surrounded by political or hostile tweets, even if they're not directed at you, it changes your mood entirely. Oh yeah, it's it's crazy. Like and that's why it just blows my mind that they're that you know people will just like watch the news. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like just have the news on. It's like that is just hijacking your happiness and consciousness, like what you're thinking about all day, right? Yeah. It's just like that's not going to be like a happy life. And I like we've got a perfect example right now with this Mueller report, right? Like the report is not out. There's nothing to talk about in it <laughs> because we haven't seen it. But the news channels were just like talking about it nonstop. Like what might be in it? Like what does it mean? It's like... <laughs> Nobody has any idea. Chill out. Like, go, you know, read this book instead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but man, it's like, it's like, well, I understand why the networks do it because it's a business, I guess, at the end of the day. Yeah. And they know people watch it, but it's the people who watch it. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Why are you watching it? <laughs> I even find newspapers to be better than network news because of that. Like, I mean, at least newspapers, they're not hooking you in the same way. As right. like a because the network news, I feel like they, I mean, I rarely see it, but it, you know, occasionally you, you'll see it somewhere, like in a airport or something, and um, or like sometimes I'll I'll, I'll see it on at, at my house, and you notice it's always like two people with opposing opinions yelling at each other. <laughs> yeah, and it reminds me a lot of uh, there was a show that I watched, um, or there are two shows I watched, sports shows in high school, um, and I'd, I'd watch them almost daily. There was Around the Horn, which was basically this host and four different, basically, sports writers uh, from different markets. So it'd be like someone from New York, someone from LA, and like I forget where the other two were from. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there was another show called Pardon the Interruption, which was two guys opposing views on basically every topic that was on the <laughs> list and just yelling at each other. It was, it was very entertaining for a 15-year-old me, but I went and tried to watch one of them recently, and it was... It was pretty annoying, actually. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> because I was just, I was like, there's no way you guys actually disagree on every single one of these topics. Like, you're definitely doing it for the viewers. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just like pure entertainment. Remember that old show, Crossfire? Yeah. That old political show? Yeah. yeah. It's like that. What if we did that? <laughs> what if like every episode we just had to disagree on everything and yell at each other? It'd be a good like acting practice, I feel like, because even if you didn't agree with the position, you'd have to passionately convey the points and convince the audience that you really cared about that. <laughs> yeah, it might be good like debate practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, sp speaking of that and of where is it? The uh, that, that let's see, it was like the outraged attitude or something. I saw something the other day about like kids at, I want to say Berkeley or something complaining to the school that their ethics professor asked them to debate the side of an issue they disagreed with. Oh my God. That's like the definition of like, <laughs> that's what you do in a debate team. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh. Uh, I tell you, dude, it's like every, every month I get further and further from believing my kids will ever go to college. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but here's like the flip side to that though, right? I bet it was a couple yeah. kids who said that. Yeah, no, it's it's not like the whole school. It's just like a couple of kids. But when we see the headline too, see like we're falling for it at this point. It's like, oh, yeah, no, it's like I... we'll be like, oh, everybody at Berkeley does like thinks this. And it's like, no, they're probably like a very, very small minority of people. But then it's a great headline to say students at UC Berkeley refuse to debate a topic they disagree. With. You know, it's like a very easy headline. Yeah. Like you and I would click on that. It's good. It's good clickbait. Yeah. <laughs> It's confirming our existing biases, so yeah, we're going to click and share that shit. There's a lot of these clickbait headlines. Like I know we're spending we're over time on this one, but we were under time on the others, so it's okay. Um, for even for like the Lyft IPO, right? I saw a bunch of these articles. I knew nothing about who invest, invested in Lyft, but I saw a bunch of articles being like, oh, like the same you know few white male VCs are making tons of money off this Lyft IPO, and then like there were a few other VCs who who like shared on Twitter. Uh, that the biggest seed check was from this like 
Asian lady, like individual investor for, who lives in New York and like is a pretty prominent angel. Yeah. But just like the New York Times just completely decided and all these different other, I mean, it wasn't just the New York Times. So it's, I don't want to just single them out. There are several others, but they just like decided to omit that information, even though she's like the biggest check at the earliest stage <laughs> and made, you yeah. know, probably like ridiculous amount of money off the investment, but it doesn't work for the narrative that they were, they wanted to push. Like you wouldn't get any clicks for that, right? No, it's not as exciting. Yeah. So we're just going to omit like that. This was the biggest check <laughs> just to get a good headline. <laughs> you know who else was apparently an early stage investor in Lyft? Who? Nas. Really? Yeah. Again, I never saw that anywhere, <laughs> at least in the those articles. Well, I, I found this on... Let me let me see if I can find it here. I found this on Twitter last week. Nas is actually like a really good investor. Yeah, he has. Uh, I think the firm was like Queensbridge Ventures or something like that, right? I came across it once. Yeah, let's see. I don't know if he still has Queen Queensbridge Ventures, but I know he did like co-found a VC firm at one point in time. Yeah, he invested in Lyft, Dropbox, Ring, Pill Pack, Pluto TV. I don't know, but like a lot of big investments. Yeah, I mean, even just one of those, is, <laughs> you did pretty well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really nice. Um, yeah, I bet. Like, I mean, I never saw that anywhere, but I I, I believe it's it. Not as exciting. Yeah, it's not exciting. <laughs> it doesn't fit the narrative. Doesn't fit the narrative. All right. Anyway, spent a lot of time on that. I did. Okay. This is the law of repression. Confront your dark side. He opens this one by saying that part of your job in studying human nature is to recognize and examine the dark side of your character uh, because everyone has it like you can't deny that there are going to be parts of your character that are bad and you have to like seek those out figure out where they're coming from and then see how you can basically improve yourself to deal with those parts of your behavior yeah exactly i would also say that this is related to the point of um actually let me ask you this question do you think that i think i know i know how you're gonna answer i think but let's see i'm curious um, would you say like people are good or bad or are there, I don't know, are there like levels or are there, uh, in, is it environment based or is it just like circumstances based? Like, do you, like when people commit bad acts, are they bad people or are they, um, you know, normal people just in bad circumstances or is it a, is it a hard to define kind of matrix of factors? I would say that there's like very little genetic determination for whether you're a good or bad person. Like there's going to be some inclinations, but I think a lot of whether or not you become like a well socialized or antisocial person is going to be from your environment and your upbringing. Yeah. So like people can definitely be bad, but it's not necessarily entirely their fault that they are that way. It's probably how I'd put it. Right. Yeah. No, and I that's how I thought you would answer that. And I think that that's kind of what he's pushing for here as well uh in the book is that yeah that everybody has this dark side that expresses itself at some level you know more or less depending on um i think well part of it is your own awareness of it right because i would i would argue like some mob mob mentality or like mob behavior or you know the fact that all of germany went along with not all but most of germany went along the nazis right it's not that all of those people were like pre-programmed to be bad Right. It's just that, you know, different circumstances can can bring that type of thing out. Um, I think that's part of what he's pushing for here is just that, like, everybody has this kind of dark side to them. And being aware of it, number one, is, you know, I guess the first step to not I don't want to use the word like controlling it, but at least recognizing it when it's coming out. Yeah. And I think that well, it's like there's two sides to it, right? One is recognizing when you're doing one of these behaviors like showing your shadow showing your dark side yeah and then i I think the other is kind of what you were alluding to which is acknowledging that you are not some like special moral person and that if you you know if you grew up and you were in like an awful gang and drug dealing environment like you're not magically going to you're most like you're you're not any more likely than anyone else to morally transcend that and get out of it, right? Like, yeah, you're probably as influenced by your environment as anyone else. Just because you turned out good doesn't mean that you are like special, and if that makes sense, right? So it's like, yeah, like when you talk about you know the the Nazi example, right? It's like most people who were in that environment, like 
probably would have ended up being persuaded by it in one form or another too, right? Which is like a shitty, scary, like awful thing to think about, but we kind of have to recognize that that's the only explanation for how that happened. Yeah. And also I think it's easy to turn a blind eye in the day-to-day reality of like all the bad things that are going on. Like for example, slavery too. I feel like yeah. now we're so quick to judge anybody who lived in that era who owned or condoned slavery. And it's, I mean, and, and yeah, like, don't get me wrong. Slavery is, is like a horrible, horrible thing. And I don't wish it on anybody. And I don't, I'm not proponent of slavery by any means. I, I just don't think it's like necessarily like it, you can't judge like a historical character, like, like a, or, or a historical character of people in circumstances that you kind of, I mean, you can, you can say like, yeah, slavery is a, a bad thing and that, you know, you don't condone slavery, but you, there's no way to know how you would have acted in those same circumstances. Yeah. I read uh 12 years a slave uh, recently, like maybe a few months ago. And uh, that's one of the biggest takeaways I got from that. So this guy, if I don't know if you, have you seen the movie or no? No, no. Okay, it's a great, great movie. And, and the book is actually really short too. So it's a, it's an easy, it's a pretty easy read. Um, but he's a free guy, like living in upstate New York, uh, was like a farmer and, and small businessman and actually very, you know, pretty well off for, uh, like a black American at that time. Um, uh, obviously slavery was still in existence, but he was free and, uh, you know, he got captured, uh, he got kind of tricked and captured when he took a trip to DC and they sold him into slavery. And uh, he had to spend 12 years as a slave. And you would imagine somebody like that would be very resentful to the whole like slaveholder enterprise. And his biggest takeaway from being a slave for those 12 years was that most of these people uh, were not like the slave owners were not necessarily like cruel individuals. It's just that they grew up like their parents, own, you know, own slaves. And that's all they saw as, as children. And then, you know, they grew up and this was like a norm. Like to them, that was the normal reality. It's not like they were trying to maliciously own a slave because, you know, he mentions out of his, I think he had four different masters or three different masters during those 12 years. And besides one, he said they were very compassionate human beings that he would have been friends with in New York if he was like living near them. Uh, yeah. But he thinks that the, he basically his premise was that the environment they grew up in and lived in was such a formative factor in their belief system uh, that they found nothing wrong with slavery because of just that's all they knew. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very it's very interesting, and, it. and he had that same viewpoint for other slaves too. Like he said, some of the other the slaves he was with were kind of like they didn't think there was something wrong with their circumstances because they didn't know that there was other like there was anything else, right. and that wasn't true for all of them. But he said that was true for a, a lot of the slaves that he had met were because he was a free person who became a slave. So that's a very different thing than growing up only around slavery and thinking that's all there is. Yeah, uh, I don't think anyone is like magically immune to their environment and how that can shape. Yeah, the way they think about everything, like it's just, and if you think you are, you're you're probably lying to yourself. It's human nature. Yeah, it's human nature, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. So the next one is the law of envy. Beware the fragile ego. And I mean, this is a big one, just because he's talking a lot about how you can pick up on it in other people, like little things they'll say and do that convey some sense of envy or insecurity. Uh, around you and i know like i hear women talk about this a lot with other women but men mm. definitely do it too like in, yeah. i think just in different ways but it's like the better and better you get at catching these little things that can come up in discussions especially in groups it's almost like there's a a second layer to any group discussion going on with like these little envy status jockeying whatever games going on beneath it especially if it's like a a group where everyone isn't already close right like a little bit of sniffing out, figuring out. Yeah. Like who's the alpha dog here or something. Like, yeah. yeah. Who's the alpha dog or right. Like, you know, kind of jockeying for position in the group. Yeah. And especially if, especially I've noticed if people are doing like, I feel like if you have, let's say five people who are each doing something totally different, like there's no overlap at all. Yeah. Maybe it can be a little bit more uh, like low key or collegial. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's better in that case. Yes. Like, I feel like if you have like five founders, let's say in, in a room, like there's going to be some sort of judge judgmental behavior going on. <laughs> yeah. It's like who raised the most money, like yeah. who's got the biggest team, right? Yep. <laughs> or you've got like five uh, lawyers, right? Who's got the biggest paycheck or it's like the, the closer you are to other people or like, you know, you're in college. It's like, who's got the highest GPA? Who's got the best job, right? The closer you are to other people, the more you will envy them. 
and resent them. Uh, what's what's the term for that? Like Girardian terror, I think. Yeah. Oh, it is. That's uh, <laughs> that's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't. I've heard that term. I just never knew what it meant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's a really good article um, titled "College as an Incubator of Girardian Terror" by uh, Dan Wang, and it talks a lot about this. How some of the like crazy college campus stuff is a symptom of basically everybody on campus really being the same, and how the whole like like there's not really any diversity on college campuses. It's mm-hmm. like you know, or and we can apply this to like a law firm too, right? Like an old white dude law firm. It's like everyone's basically the same person. Yeah. <laughs> they went to the same few schools, same few like country clubs, whatever. And so there's going to be way more like keeping up with the Joneses envy behavior. So I've talked about it in skin in the game and there we go. We have a Taleb reference. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, have have so, uh, no, didn't he talk about that where it's like uh, when somebody gets rich, they, instantly start getting sold like things that other rich people also buy and they're like just jockeying for you know who has the best or, like remember yeah. he gave like the pizza example or or no the what was it the burger example or pizza, whatever it was it was like yeah well, he, he talks about going to like michelin three-star restaurants yes. yeah it's like street corner pizza is always going to taste better yeah <laughs> Uh, but it's kind of that's kind of a good point. I, I that's a I never thought about it that way um, until you just described it. But any environment where people are more or less the same will have jockeying with weird little status symbols that you know from an outside view probably look ridiculous. Um, but if you're in one of those, they don't seem ridiculous. <laughs> Is that like you look at it from the outside and the things they're competing on just seem absurd? Yep. Right. <laughs> It's like competing on Instagram likes or competing on, you know, GPA or competing on like your Wall Street bonus or, you know, I guess the money ones are a little more understandable because money is sort of a universal one. But the things within or okay, so like maybe the what's what's the thing from uh, American Psycho, like the the color and the print on the business cards. Oh, yeah. Have you watched that movie? (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was a long time back. But yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I remember that scene. He like starts sweating and freaking out that the other guy's business card is like just slightly better than his. <laughs> yeah, I I also think that um even the, going back to what you said a second ago, like the the money part, mm-hmm. even that from like an outside view can start to look ridiculous after a certain level, uh, because yeah. I think there's like different things that motivate people. Like somebody somebody who's going for something that may happen to make them money, but they're all they're just attacking it because it's a problem they want to do or it's something they want to do that's like a different thing than just like chasing money right i think those are different because i mean it's, it's hard to distinguish right because i'm sure all these motivations are you know mashed up in our brains and you know have us doing different types of behaviors but if uh if somebody who makes like let's say somebody is worth i don't know a hundred million dollars you definitely see people who are worth that much money kind of look at people who are worth like a billion dollars enviously <laughs> um even though there's yeah. not a whole lot you can't buy at a hundred million dollars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What what extra freedom are you going to get exactly? Right, but it's like a, um, I don't know. It's a jockeying for position. It's kind of like, I mean, at, I guess at the base level, and this is part of what Robert Greene talks about in all of his books. We definitely have some of those animal instincts, and this is a way of like, you know, a dollar amount is a way of showing like, yeah, I'm the alpha dog, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a way of kind of like it's more status than the actual money itself. Like the money is kind of just the metric. Yeah, m- money is just a way of keeping score. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's always funny to see that. Like you see sometimes uh, there's someone I, I won't uh, mention who it is, but somebody I met in New York who you know, I think he's worth like a couple hundred million dollars, and uh, it was funny like hearing him talk about like. You know, he's like, yeah, like, you know, the next one, I'm hoping to get like a billion dollar exit. And I didn't ask him this because I was kind of intimidated, but I didn't ask like, why? <laughs> like, yeah. like, what, like, why do you need the billion dollar exit? Like, you're worth a couple hundred million dollars. What's the, <laughs> like, what else can you buy after that? Uh, but it's probably, it, what I'm guessing is it's probably he goes to similar events as like billionaires and he's might be like the least net worth person in the room and then you feel like shit i'm a loser <laughs> yep i only have one plane and <laughs> these guys have <laughs> you guys have their west coast and their east coast plane exactly but i think we all do that to an extent right like i bet yeah. you know you and i probably you know have things we're going after and then somebody who lives in you know a village somewhere looks at us like you guys have a computer like why do you need a new one <laughs> or 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like probably everybody does that to an extent. That's that's actually something I like about working on the cafe is that I don't know anybody with a cafe. Yeah. And so there's <laughs> no one for me to be jealous of. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. There's no measuring stick. It's more just for your for yourself. Yeah, exactly. All right. We got to get to the next one. Yep. Uh, this is the law of grandiosity. Know your limits. And this ties a lot into the stuff we were just talking about, where it's kind of it's it's easy to get an inflated sense of self. And so you've got to keep that in check. And I, I like the guide he gives here, which is that you should tie any feelings of greatness to your actual work and achievements and your contributions to society, not to like something special about you. Because yeah. that's where it can get dangerous. Yeah, that's where it gets tied to your ego. Yeah. And and less to the actual work itself and thinking there's something special about you. And I think that's where you can have like, um, I don't know, these moments that you kind of see of extreme hubris, like uh, Theranos, I feel like is a really interesting example of this. Mm. You know, I think I think she did a like, I, I would say fundraising and getting high profile mentors and stuff is is there's probably a skill to that, right? Yeah, and she did a great job of that. And so she like, I'm, I'm just maybe projecting here. But, you know, it seems like it kind of like got or she she and probably not just her, but I'm guessing at least from what I've read, like there's a few other kind of key close people in the company um, who all kind of got tied into this, this feeling of like, well, we are, you know, doing something great. Like there's, you know, there's kind of like these weird comparisons to like Apple and Steve Jobs that she was doing. And yeah, it just seems like it got, there was something that got caught there in the ego uh, as opposed to saying like, oh no, you know, we're trying to build a great company. And then you keep the focus on the work as opposed to like, we as individuals are, you know, an elevated uh, level. Um, and can kind of pass this bullshit off on people. Dude, and the flip side of that too is the investors yeah. in uh, Theranos, Theranos. It's like, apparently nobody ever asked for an audited financial statement. Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah. And so they must have just been like, oh no, this will be another like home run for us. Like we just put the money and we don't have to worry about it too much. And you know, that, that didn't go very well. So my dad has been doing like, uh, has been on like the in pharma and small company and large company his entire career. And we were talking about them. And they like it, he just like couldn't can't believe half the stuff that's coming out about them, like no audited uh, financials, no one on their board who really has a pharma background <laughs> um, <laughs> is pretty fascinating, right? There's like I don't know I don't think there was a single like ND who was close to them. Jeez, yeah, there was a lot of stuff where it was just like they, she got some really good Silicon Valley names, right? But not really any you know. And there's something to be said. Okay, it's all outsiders. Like yeah, we're gonna do something the industry's never done. But like his point was just like, you know, was that, okay, so you don't have anybody with this, the expertise who can back you up on this. <laughs> and then yeah. the investors still put in money and that much money um, is kind and of She's apparently shocking. related to one of the Enron guys. No. Yeah, I, I know I saw something about this. Oh, man. Uh, I feel bad for the other people related to them who are like normal people. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like another one of our cousins did this. Yeah. Her father was a vice president at Enron. No way. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. That's wild. But anyway, the, the one thing I do like in here that he gives as prescriptive advice is the, you know, so tie your sense of achievement to your work and then to always look for challenges just above your skill level. Yeah. You've talked about that. And I, I really like that. It's like that's the best way to build that kind of like sense of, I guess, like self-efficacy, right? Without, without, and you still have to check it because it is, you can fall into that trap of like, oh, I'm special. But as long as you're like continuously conquering things like a little bit harder, a little bit harder, like you'll make a lot of progress over time. I think continuously conquering, but also occasionally like falling flat on your face, but not in a way that you can't recover um, yeah. is important. I think he talks about that. Yeah. Like if they're, if you're, if the projects you attempt are below or at your skill level, you'll become easily bored and less focused. If they're too ambitious, you'll feel crushed by your failure. However, if they're calibrated to be more challenging than the last project, but to a moderate degree, you will find yourself excited and energized. Uh, and I think there's definitely something to that. Because, yeah, if it's again, if it's like a video game, like I, I think you brought this up maybe on Twitter somewhere, um, that if you are playing a video game, you just win every single time you quickly get bored. It's not even any fun or you use cheat codes and win every time it's not fun after like yeah. two minutes. Yeah. You might be like, yeah, I'm invincible for like a minute. And then you're like, all right, I'm, this sucks. It's boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got an article on this called uh, increasing the difficulty. Maybe that's where I read about it. Yeah. I yeah. knew you'd written something about it. Uh, 
Yeah, and I really like that. Like, I think it's it's a great way to keep yourself motivated, and it's cool because it's it's kind of scalable to whatever level you are in whatever you're talking about. Like that idea. Like you can be you you can know nothing about, let's say SEO, right? And you can just give yourself a very kind of easy task to try to learn about it, or know nothing about programming, right? And give yourself like, okay, I'm going to build you know a program that flips a coin or something, right? Like you can just start really right. small and then like just elevate. Um, and even if you've been doing something for a while, you can also set a challenge that's just above your skill level. So yeah, there's uh it's like an infinitely scalable tactic here. Infinite game. Infinite game. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is the law of gender rigidity. Reconnect to the masculine or feminine within you. The main thing I liked from this was how he calls out that some of the things that you find attractive in the opposite sex or in you know whichever sex you're attracted to is something that you need to develop within yourself mm. bringing out that feminine or masculine undertone so like if you're really attracted to assertiveness in someone like that might be a sign that you need to work on your own assertiveness mm. or if you're really attracted to you know someone's empathy that maybe sign you need to work on your own empathy i feel like there's a lot of truth to that i think it's good advice and a good tool for introspection and personal development Right. And I think like one other thing I really like and kind of like related to that that I really liked is how he's kind of using these like masculine traits, feminine traits as uh, just as like descriptors. Like he doesn't mean that, oh, like em being empathetic is only for women right? <laughs> or like right. being assertive is only for men, but it's just like a descriptor. A and I think there's a lot of what he's saying. I, I know like, you know, we shit on the SJW thing all the time, but there is something to like the gender fluidity thing that there's traits of different like if you call them feminine traits or masculine traits, like everybody has some combination of all of those traits. Like there's like women can be assertive, right? Like there's no, <laughs> nothing that says women can't be assertive, even though that might be a traditionally masculine uh, trait. So when he's saying like masculine trait, that's what he's talking about there. Yeah. Or feminine trait. That's what he's talking about. But yeah, I think that's a good point. It's almost like uh, I think I heard was it Tim Ferriss talk about this where on one of his like relationship episodes or something. Or maybe it was someone else. I don't know. I bet you've I bet you've heard this concept though, where uh, you almost like think about the other person, um, like the you know whoever you're attracted to, whether it's you know your opposite sex or or not, or same sex. Like it's th your partner has to have kind of like the complementary to you. So if you're you know let's say I think Tim Ferriss said it this way. Like if you are very much on the like feminine empathetic scale, probably the best partner for you might be on the assertive, like, you know, dominant scale and like on the mm. same level. So if you're like, I don't know, if, uh, it's really hard to describe this without showing an image, but um, if you're like 50, level 50, right, of <laughs> assertive, like you might like a level 50 of the, you know, empathetic uh, side of things and you might be a really good fit. So uh, I think, in, I think it was Tim Ferriss now that I think back, I think he said it's like the problems come when someone is like, let's say somebody is only slightly assertive and then tries to to uh, form a relationship with someone who is, let's say, extremely empathetic. So like level 10 yeah. with like a level 100 um, and like that will cause problems. Uh, so it's I think it's kind of like what Robert Greene is saying here, right? It's like the complimentary part to you. I believe it. Yeah. All right. Next, we've got the law of aimlessness to advance with a sense of purpose. And this is one that we've talked about I think in a lot of episodes, but basically that you'll be most motivated and I think the happiest if you have some like higher sense of purpose or mission driving what you're doing, uh, as opposed to just following the direction or the aim of your parents, friends, or peers. Yeah. And I think that the, um, the thing that's always interesting about conversations like, or like topics like this is that, you know, on some level life is meaningless. <laughs> right it's like we're, we're all chasing <laughs> like i mean we are we are all chasing yeah. things it's like you know and, and he gets this later right they're like we are all gonna die but it's like at the same time it's really helpful and I, you know i don't know for like what reason it's probably our own biology is how and we're just wired this way um but it really makes life feel more meaningful when you have a higher purpose and i guess yeah. ultimately that's all we can go for right is like it feels more meaningful um, doesn't mean it is more meaningful. <laughs> I guess it just means that. <laughs> and as long as it feels more meaningful, though, it, like there's something to that of that makes you feel happy and it makes you feel good. And yeah, it's, as he says, like there are obstacles and, you know, um, but not having any kind of meaning or any kind of higher purpose is a way to feel 
Uh, I think he says like anxious, depressed, and stressed. Well, and I would probably reword it a bit because I feel like this terminology of higher purpose and like personal mission muddies the water. Yeah, I think it makes it more confusing. Yeah, you hear that and you're like, Ugh, like uh, mission statement, right? Like I'm not thinking on that high level. I, I To me, it's just like having something to be excited about, right? Yep. It's like if you've got something where you actually want to like wake up and do it, like that's good enough, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't need to be like, oh, I'm like God's soldier, or like something like that, right? <laughs> because like that's when I don't know when I think of higher purpose initially, like that was my first thought. I was like, oh, I don't have a higher purpose. Like I'm not, yeah, you know, like I don't, I'm not like getting out of bed to cure cancer. You know, just like it, it almost it feels like it's something above you when you say higher purpose. It's like that, that's not I, that's something other people have, and you know, I don't have that. So that's a really good way of framing it. It's whatever gets you like gets you out of bed, basically. Yeah. That's a good purpose. Yeah. And for some people, I mean, that could be like, you know, you're, it, it, you know, you have a child or, or something and you want to help that child or you want to spend time with that child. It could be your job. It could be, a, you know, a hobby. I mean, it could be anything. But yeah, having, I guess, something that, let, I like that terminology better. Something that gets you out of bed or something that gets you excited. Yeah. And that's like the easiest heuristic too. It's like if you get up and you, and you want to do something, then you've, you're like doing a good job with this. If you don't want to like, get out of bed, then you're probably, you haven't found this, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's like a useful tool too. It's like if you're, you know, waiting till the absolute like last possible minute to, to like do whatever you're doing, like you probably obviously don't like it very much, yeah. right? Then that's a sign that you want to like try to change something and you're, that you're probably not doing something that gives you that, that sense of purpose. Uh, I just feel like people judge themselves if that sense of purpose isn't something like big and special but it doesn't have to be right yep yeah and i i actually was trying to get so i like how you describe this more than how i described it so i may write a follow-up post to this um but i wrote a <laughs> post like a few a few weeks ago called it entertainment isn't dumb and it was basically just around the point of you know like people who let's say work let's say somebody makes like a netflix show or, or somebody makes like a video game and i actually that was inspired by i was talking to this guy who designs video games and um he, he said something in the conversation of like, it's like, yeah, but like I'm not curing cancer or anything. And like, I don't know, that like sent me down a rabbit hole of like Googling, like I'm sure people kind of when let's say there's a child who is going, who does have cancer and is playing one of his games, like feels momentary pleasure. Like there's something really valuable to what he's doing. And yeah, he's not curing cancer, but he's possibly really helping a child who is going through cancer or experiencing that. Yeah, And so, yeah, to your point, it's very easy to feel kind of down on yourself if your purpose is not like, oh, like I'm, you know, curing AIDS or like, what, you know, whatever. Like not everybody's going to be doing that, but you're probably doing something in your own way, shape or form that is, I mean, hopefully meaningful to you and gets you excited. But then it's probably bringing pleasure to somebody. Like, honestly, even just like, let's say your tea company, let's say Cup and Leaf, right? Like that is providing value to people. Like people are buying yeah. or discovering new teas and like. You know, I mean, there's something to that. Like, there, people will get pleasure out of that. I hope so. Yeah, I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> a nice cup of tea is good. Although, yeah. at the moment, I'm drinking a mushroom coffee, so. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, next up is the law of conformity. Resist the downward pull of the group. It's mm. a good one. It's important. Uh, and I think the big thing he's calling out here is kind of like we talked about a couple of times, but just being aware of the fact that you're not immune to the way being in a group will change how you think. And you need to kind of like be cognizant of that. Notice how being around people changes the way you're behaving and thinking. And then I think reflect on that and try to make sure that you're making decisions based off, you know, what you want and what you think, not just what the group wants or thinks. Yeah. Have you noticed this too? Like I, I had to try to not like I didn't, I didn't like unfollow people, but I had to follow additional people. Um, I noticed sometimes myself getting into, uh, or at least my Twitter account, and then through that me, um, getting into like the, almost like the contrarian circle jerk is what I'm trying to like call it. Oh, yeah. Right? Where it's like, it's like you feel like you're holding a contrarian opinion, but it's just the same contrarian opinion that everybody else also holds that you follow. Yep. And then you're like, wait a minute, am I actually contrarian or am I, am I even <laughs> thinking for myself or am I just falling into this conformity thing <laughs> with just a different group? Yeah, it's like the, the goth person who's dressing different from everyone by dressing the same as a different group of people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've definitely caught myself doing that a few times. So it's, 
yeah, it's important to be aware of this um, because it doesn't just mean like the mainstream group. It could just mean your your circle. Yeah, it's like who you tweet amongst. Or I, I had a really good example of this recently. Who was I talking to? Oh, yeah. So it was it was about LinkedIn. Mm. And I was talking to someone and I'm I'm definitely like I feel like I'm in, for lack of a better term, like the cool kids. We don't hang out on LinkedIn club. Right. Like <laughs> uh like LinkedIn is for, you know, losers in suits who like care about their uh like corporate job and shit. But at the same time, it's like very good for sales. Yeah. And would probably be a useful place to like build a following on. And I kind of have to recognize that like my negative impressions of LinkedIn are probably hurting me more than they're helping me. And <laughs> because you sit on the cool kids table. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's like, it's like everybody's on Twitter, like, uh, like screw those losers on LinkedIn. It's like a weird tribal thing. Uh, I just have to <laughs> get out of that. <laughs> uh, it's like, it, it's funny. I, I, it's almost like all these different groups are just like high school, Yeah, but just with different, just with like different names for them. It's like you have just like different, different lunch tables. <laughs> exactly. Different lunch tables. Like that's the LinkedIn table. They come to school wearing suits. Yeah. Sit in front of class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a good point. Like it, it's very easy to, uh, to like fall into that. Like I, I've definitely seen, I mean, everybody's in different, different groups, but yeah, I've seen like even, uh, and it's funny when you interact with groups that you're not normally a part of, like I've mm-hmm. heard, um, like I remember it was like 2017. It was around the time I was leaving uh, Estee Lauder. And I remember we were talking about some marketing plan for something. And I brought up Twitter. Like I was like, oh, why isn't like Twitter on the screen? Right. And somebody said like, oh, Twitter, isn't that only for like Donald Trump and people like him? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what? It's like, because, you know, like Twitter is definitely my most used social network. And, th- and that's true for a lot of the other people that I work with and respect. And so... I was just shocked. But then I realized like, and nobody else in the room was surprised by that comment. And I was like, wait a minute, corporate America doesn't use Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. It's, it was, it's weird. Like different groups hold different heuristics and it's like easy to conform to them, even though I'm sure, you know, their, their business could have been improved by using Twitter more effectively. Uh, I yeah. mean, look at, look at like Taco Bell and like <laughs> some of the cool Twitter brands, right? I feel like they've improve their uh their brand credibility without having to improve their food at all (laughs) Uh, absolutely so yeah it's like not a rational thing it's just probably like oh we don't use twitter because like that's where you know donald trump tweets so we don't want to do that (laughs) what is it people like me do things like this or whatever the the seth godin line is yep yeah all right next up is the law of fickleness make them want to follow you Honestly, I wasn't 100% sure where fickleness came into this. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really like the law of authority, it seemed, right? It's yeah, you want to turn yourself into someone that people want to follow. Uh and he he calls out a few really core things, listening skills, which we've talked about a lot before, dedicating yourself to earning people's respect. Right. So which he says you do by respecting people's individual needs and proving that you're working for the greater good. And then third, taking the leadership as a huge responsibility and making sure that you're considering the welfare of the group in every decision and that they know you're constantly right. considering the welfare of the group. It seemed like the big things that help turn you into someone that uh, a group of people would want to follow. Right. So that you're like putting the group above yourself, basically. Yeah. And he, he seems to, or he's arguing too, that it's like a very long-term play because he says that like as early on in your career as possible, you want to develop the highest possible standards for your work and training yourself to be super aware of how your manner and tone are affecting the people around you. So seeing how people react to what you're doing and making sure that you're doing the best job in your work that you can do because your reputation is going to play a really big role in whether or not you can succeed in becoming some kind of leader. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, well, that, that point made me think of mastery actually. Um, mm. cause it's almost like something that could have been in mastery. Yeah. And I'm sure he did talk about it in mastery to some extent. Yeah. yeah. The other point in here that, uh, I think is, I mean, he's been saying things like this throughout the book, but, um, the idea of sending mixed signals and showing qualities that are ever so slightly contrary, uh, yeah. you don't allow people to categorize you. And, and this is something 
I think was it in Way of Zen or in maybe in one of the other books that we we did, but like we we all do this. Um, we aren't actually looking at reality. Like we're we're looking at like boxes of reality. Like I'm looking at my desk right now. Like I have a book, I have an iPad, I have a computer, I have a microphone, but I'm not like actually looking at any of them because they're just like discrete objects. So I've like categorized them in my mind. But if I actually look at like I'm now I'm looking at my microphone. Mm -hmm. There's like a speck of dust on it, right? And like the wire is bending this way. But like I didn't notice any of that before, um, before I actually looked at it, right? So like I feel like most of us, you know, if you're if you can categorize someone, you're just like, oh, that's the, you know, that's the entrepreneur in the group, or like that's the jock, or that's the, you know, like you just like categorize them, and then you're not really paying attention. But his point here is if you kind of send mixed signals, if you're kind of not allowing people to instantly categorize you, they're gonna pay more attention because they're trying to figure you out. Mm, yeah yeah so i think that's like a i mean he said things like that throughout the book but it's a he put it really nicely here definitely i think of kanye with that (laughs) yeah it's a good example like i feel like kanye has done a really good job of that and pretty much anybody who's good at eliciting attention yeah yeah exactly um but yeah like how he'll like not tweet and then tweet like a thousand times it seems like in a row yeah yeah and just stuff like that or like say yeah i mean it you're right i think the way you just said it like anybody who's good at listing attention um, has kind of figured that out. Definitely. All right. Okay. You do this one. I've, I've introduced like most of them so far. <laughs> do you have it? Damn. My strategy didn't work. Uh, all right. So the, <laughs> the law of the law of aggression, see the hostility behind the friendly facade. Uh, and this one was, this one was really interesting too. Like, I mean, I think uh, you've probably experienced this. I've definitely experienced this. There are some people who are almost like overly, kind of like friendly to people, right? Have you have you ever experienced that? Like, mm-hmm. have you ever met somebody who... Yeah, it turns me off too. I don't like it. Especially if you don't know them. Like, you're like, what yeah. have I done to earn your friendliness and your respect? <laughs> and maybe they're not being... I mean, I don't... I, like, maybe I'm being naive and like not thinking there's something behind it. So maybe not everybody is being kind of fake or, or kind of trying to get something out of you. Uh, but usually they are, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like people who've read... Uh, how to win friends and influence people yeah. a little too much and <laughs> you meet them and they like say your name a little bit more than it's natural. And they keep like touching your shoulder and it's just like, shut up, like stop it. Right. Like <laughs> it's one like smack them a little bit. Like you were not actually this person. Like you clearly took some training course or something on how to be a better <laughs> yeah. salesperson or better connector. And you're like, you're not even talking to me. You're just trying to like act out this nice person it just really bugs me yeah and i i think the uh yeah well, the 100 i 100 agree with that um but the other part of this of this chapter was like more inward looking right it's it's that we all have aggressive tendencies and we're all it's like more of a spectrum than a this you know more than more than a binary thing like yes that person's aggressive this person's not it's more of a spectrum um and we're all on it at some level yeah most of us probably repress it. I mean, this is something that I really like about uh, like martial arts or, or even like sports in general. It brings out that aggressive part in people who might not have thought they were aggressive. Um, it's not just a martial arts. I guess it's any sport. But you can you like can bring it out for productive use. And then you're kind of surprised that you even have it because um, you might not have thought of yourself as an aggressive individual. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's there. So and then you're channeling uh, it productively yeah. because that, that's the big thing he talks about in this section, which is kind of like the, the section on the shadow, right? It's the yep. everyone's got an aggressive side, whether you exhibit it overtly or passively. Uh, and your your task is to not deny that you are aggressive, but to learn how you can channel it into something productive. Yep. Right. Because if you can use that aggression to like, you know, destroy problems in your past or in your path and work really hard at things and, you know, pursue stuff that's exciting, like then you're using it productively. But if you use it to play like social games and to tear other people down, you know, then you're just being antisocial and you're not going to have many friends at your birthday party. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think like, I mean, he brings up a great point here that aggression is not necessarily bad. Aggression can be used for very productive things. Right. I think, what did he have this year? Yeah, it says uh, almost nothing in the world can resist persistent human energy. Yeah, I like that line. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's kind of true. Like we have solved, I mean, that reminds me of um, what's Dennett's book that we read? 
Yeah, the beginning of Infinity. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of uh, you know that like kind of his premise as well is that you know there's no such thing as an unsolvable problem, just problems we haven't solved yet. Right, or something's either forbidden by the laws of physics or solvable given enough knowledge and resources. Right, I think that's basically how he phrases it. Yep. But yeah, but that kind of I think what Green is trying to say is that that starts with that same aggressive instinct. Um, yeah, like to conquer those problems or to solve those problems, there's an element of aggression there to drive that persistence. Yeah, it's I think yeah he says the trick is to want something badly enough that nothing will stop you or dull your energy. Yeah, Hannibal's motto: I will either find a way or make a way. Yeah, I like. Oh, that. and then one other thing that this hopefully doesn't lead us to a tangent, but I'll say it anyway. Um, so this is another thing he says in that chapter, which is most people engage in some cathartic release of their anger, some giant protest, and then it goes away and they slip back into complacency or become bitter. You want to cool your anger, bring it more to a simmer than a boil. Your controlled anger will help give you the resolve and patience you will need for what might be a longer struggle than you had imagined. I think a lot of like a lot of us fall into that, right? Is like when something we dislike uh, we come across it, we might tweet about it, we might post on Instagram about it, and then we're like, all right, I did my part uh, to solve this yeah. problem. <laughs> so that's like the cathartic release. Yeah. Kind of like a slacktivism. Yep, exactly. And we're right on time. Boom. Did it. All right. Next is the law of generational myopia. Uh, seize the historical moment. And what he's kind of saying here is that society moves in cycles of like kind of four generations and you want to know where you are in those cycles in order to take the best advantage of it. So the first generation is that of revolutionaries who make a radical break with the past to establish new rules and create chaos in the process. Uh, Then comes a second generation that craves some order. They want to stabilize the world, establish some new conventions and dogma. Then the third generation has little connection to the founders of the revolution and they're less passionate about it. So they just want to make life comfortable and they don't want things to be getting upset. They're a bit more conservative. Uh, And then the fourth generation feels society has lost its vitality and they're not sure what should replace it. So they can become cynical and they question the values they've inherited. Uh, And then from that questioning and that cynicism, you get back to the revolutionary generation. So he says, your goal is to understand as deeply as possible the spirit of your generation of the times that you live in, how you can take advantage of it and how that has affected how you perceive the world. Yeah. And I think this is, this is true. Like it seems to be true, at least for countries, for businesses. I mean, you see it like, uh, have you ever read, I forget what his, the book's name is, but it's by Sam Walton, Walmart founder. Oh no. It's really interesting. Like the premise behind Walmart is very different than kind of what it has evolved into. Okay. Yeah. So Sam Walton, uh, the founder of Walmart, he wrote kind of like an autobiography and he went over the, you know, the history of Walmart, how he started it, what is kind of basics of the business, why he started that um, and how it grew. So he like the premise behind Walmart was kind of to provide like the cheapest products in initially in markets that just didn't have access to a lot of things. So he didn't go Mm -hmm. after any large cities. And it was a really interesting, like really cool, kind of like almost contrarian style business, I want to say to start. Uh, But it was interesting Mm -hmm. that then the second generation really just kept the status quo. So his children, right? Like they did a, I would say a decent job of keeping it going, but they didn't really adapt to the changing terrain, right? I think we talked about that in one of the episodes, right? Like the map versus the terrain. Like they just kept, they kept the same map, even though the terrain was shifting. And then that kind of changed over time. And, and, you know, I would say like now, you know, Walmart, I wouldn't say it's like, it's not dead by any means, but they're, they're definitely not in the same kind of dominant market position that they were in, uh, maybe a couple of generations ago. And certainly now they're trying to catch up to what the terrain is as opposed to kind of being right on top of the, like, I would say with Sam Walton, his map was exactly on top of the terrain. But then over time, right, like the map stayed the same, but the terrain <laughs> kept changing. And uh, yeah, and it seems like now they're like trying to catch up because it's vastly different from what the terrain is. And it's it's obvious. And so now it needs to be fixed. Yeah. The, the old map had no Amazon on it. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> well, it had no Internet on it, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <At all>. no <laughs> Internet. <laughs> uh, yeah. And related to this, there's like this cool thing that uh, that Jay showed me. It's a really cool image. It's like a cyclical image, but it's very similar to what he's talking about here, which is 
Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. <laughs> yeah, I like it. It's exactly what he's talking about here. Cool. Very last one. One uh, very relevant to books we've done in the past. The Law of Death Denial. Meditate on our common mortality. And this is basically everything that got talked about in The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker that we covered a while ago. But essentially, we don't like to think about the fact that we're going to die. And that makes us act in ways that, you know, we might not if we were more, you know, aware of our own mortality. Uh, and it, you know, causes us to buy into philosophies that will save us from that fact, right? Like the technological transcendence is basically like the modern version of religion, right? It's, uh, I, I think Naval had a great line about this where he's like, oh yeah, some super powerful entity is going to give us the ability to like transcend our physical form and live for all eternity. Like we've heard this story before. <laughs> it's, it's not new. It's just like, it's in a different robe. <laughs> yeah, it is. Right. And it's funny. It's like the people who believe in that believe in it very fervently, almost like it is a religion. Yeah. No, I mean like the Ray Kurzweil group. I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. It's like the 2035 conference. Like they're so set that we're going to be able to just, upload into computers by that date that i don't know yeah and i'm not saying like it's not possible i'm not like i don't know enough to say like it's possible or not but it's uh i wouldn't bet on it let's put it that way <laughs> well I, the, the big thing to me is like there will certainly be a way to clone your mind into a computer and from the outside it would be the same as you living forever but you would i can't imagine in any way you would have the experience of moving into the computer well, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, it's like it might be externally you, but it might not be you. Yeah. Th that's a big question, right? It's like, who is you? I mean, we've talked about that, I think, on Elephant in the Brain. And yeah, like, is there even a you? Is that all an illusion, too? Right. It's just an illusion. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's like a lot to that. But uh, <laughs> I think we talked about it, too, where um, if you had like a machine that could help you teleport, but it had to kill the first one. Like, would I, I like that example. Yeah. Like, would you get into that or not? Um. <laughs> Nope. I don't know. Like, we don't know. Because, and also, here. anybody coming out the other side of that, they would say, yeah, I'm that, right? Like, there's. Yeah, like, I remember everything. Like, it worked. But. But you wouldn't know for sure. Yeah, the Nat who gets incinerated back on Earth, right? Yep. <laughs> it's like, well, and the, the variation I like of that is okay, so, you know, you get zapped here and recreated on Mars. And then people are usually like, okay, with that one, they're like, oh, yeah, cool. It's like Star Trek. And then you ask, okay, well, we're going to do that. You know, we're going to, like, you know, do the scan of you, recreate you on Mars, and then in five minutes, we'll destroy the Earth version of you. Yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> wait, back up. <laughs> this feels different now. <laughs> yeah. But it's the same thing, right? Like, well, yeah, because I don't, it, it is exactly the same thing, right? Yeah, like, I don't know. When thing. You... You're just adding a, a time lag, but no, you're, yep. <laughs> you're never going to upload your brain into a computer. You're, it's, it's not happening. You're going to die. Uh, yep. So we just got to get real comfortable with that. Yeah. And I think, well, and in a weird way, too, it's the only thing underlying like almost all motivation, right? Because if you have a perpetual tomorrow to do something. Yeah, there'd be no reason to ever do anything. Right. I mean, you could just always be like, well, I have infinite, like literally infinite time. Then what, you know, well, I can do it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, like he says here, uh, which is very much related to that. He says, we must think of our mortality as a kind of continual deadline, giving a similar effect as described above to all our actions in life. We must stop fooling ourselves. We could die tomorrow. And even if we live for another 80 years, it is but a drop in the ocean of the vastness of time, and it passes always more quickly than we imagine. We have to awaken to this reality and make it a continual meditation. Uh, and yeah, I think that's a good point because like you could, let's say you even live to 100 or, or let's go, let's go super sci-fi, right? And say you can live to 200. Mm -hmm. It's still just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> yeah. It's effectively zero, right? Like if you, if you. Yeah, it's, it's a rounding error on the cosmic scale. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you still have a deadline. I mean, you might be like, okay, I can double our life. I mean, that's, that's the other question, right? Is let's say you, the uploading your mind into a computer, like put that aside for a second, but just through medical advances and being able to keep a human being alive longer and longer, um, almost any conceivable length of time of life is still a rounding error in the cosmic yeah. scheme. <laughs> like even if you can live to a thousand and you wouldn't want immortality either. Cause you'll get stuck somewhere eventually. Yeah. Like. 
even if you even if you physically cannot die, you know, even if you're like floating in space, like, you do not want that. You want a way out because heat death of the universe, like floating around in the ether for all eternity, that doesn't sound fun either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's like it is in some ways like a, the eternal mystery, right? For everybody of like what happens after, uh, if anything, right? If anything, because it's like, okay, if you believe in simulation, like it's just, like we're all in a simulation. Yeah, you just wake up. <laughs> or maybe you respawn or something, right? It's, it's like you have no yeah. idea. Um, like, I mean, it could be, it could even be that like time and space are illusion. I mean, like there's just so much that, I mean, we know a lot about our universe, but then there's a lot we don't know about you know, like the zero time, like what happened before bi the Big Bang or what's going to happen with the heat. You know, there's like all these questions and nobody has come back from, you know, like <laughs> it, it, I heard I heard uh, a, I don't know if it's like a joke or just like one of those little anecdotes, like clever anecdotes sometime. Um, but it was like the place you go when you die must be so nice because nobody ever comes back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but I think like going back to like the, the point he's making here, right. That it's, a, it's a, the ultimate motivator. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't think like the technology and stuff is a, is an ever going to be enough to eliminate that. Yeah. Like kind of what you were saying, even if the curse wild thing is, is right. Um, and you are able to do it. Like, is it really you? <laughs> do you want to take that chance? I do not. Yeah. All right. This is cool. We made it through it. Yeah, in a reasonable amount of time too. The the timer helps, I think. We need that yeah. to, to keep ourselves honest with these huge Robert Green books. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll have a lot of tangents with the with the uh the next one, but Yeah, next episode is going to be like pure tangents cuz Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll all see. You'll see. Yeah. You'll see. I don't even know what that episode's going to be like. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I have no idea what we're going to do. But we'll figure it out. Um, Tangents find a way. Tangents will find a way for sure. But uh, yeah, Sue, if you are enjoying the episode and you're happy that we're back, obviously you can always hit us up on Twitter. I'm at Nat Eliason and Neil. I am at the real Neil S. Neil took his Twitter down for a hot sec and I was really unhappy with him. I know I got a text like immediately. So it's, <laughs> it's clear that you follow you follow me. So <laughs> I'm yep. not a muted account, apparently, because you knew right away. I have to check your account every day to see who has more followers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm way behind on that count. I need to I need to go buy some followers and piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the only way I get my sense of self worth. So. Oh man! But uh, no, I took it. Yeah, I took it down, and then I realized I uh, I took down a bunch of the accounts, but then I really I missed Twitter, obviously, because um, that's where all the action is. So yeah, I'm I'm back on Twitter. You can reach out to me there. Uh, you can also leave a review. That's always really helpful. Yep. Only if you're enjoying the Super show, helpful. not if you're if you don't enjoy. It. Yeah, if you don't enjoy the show, then I don't know why you've you're two hours into the episode. Yeah, I'm not but, sure why you're still here, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't leave a review if you don't like the show. No, strong, strong no. Uh, and then last is we'll we'll figure out something else with like bonus material and ways to support the show. But in the meantime, uh, go join the email list at madeyouthinkpodcast.com. That's the best way to stay up to date on future episodes and, and things that are going on with the show. So, yep. And there's also a few other ways to support the show. If you go to madeyouthinkpodcast.com slash support. Uh, we should double check on those. Uh, okay, we, we've got a few days before this episode goes out. Some of those do not work anymore. Uh, the Amazon one has to, right? The Amazon one works. Yes, yeah, so you can still do that. D go, go buy stuff on Amazon. Support, <laughs> support Papa Jeff. Like, well, I heard from one of our subscribers that the uh, the Four Sigmatic one, at least the link worked, and they got a discount. I don't know if we <laughs> if it tracked anything. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, because I got yeah, a I'll I check. got a photo from one of our subscribers of their all their mushroom things. Nice. Yeah. Um, and they said they used the link. So sweet. We'll check on the other ones. Aside from that, leave us a nice review. Hit us up on Twitter. Join the email list and uh, we'll see you next episode. Yeah. Make sure you share also. That's the. Oh, yeah. Share. Tell your friends. The number one way. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Yep. Bye.